Hello, everybody. Welcome to SoCal Loopers. Uh, an exciting day, and um, we're glad you're here. We get to hear from Dr. Stephen Ponder, who will talk to us all about sugar surfing, and we'll, he's well aware that we are all involved with DIY looping, so um, you've been answering his questions all week, you've been seeing his posts, um, and we have a unit set up on SoCal Loopers uh, where we're putting some of his articles so you can see that. We're going to do our regular little disclaimer. Uh, Loop is a do-it-yourself closed-loop algorithm, user interface, developed th through the work of community volunteers. While it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your diabetes management. Please remember, it's important that this project is highly experimental and not approved for therapy by the US FDA. You take full responsibility for building and running the system and you do so at your own risk. Alrighty, I'm going to give you a little bit of the rules. I have everybody muted. So um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We have several of our admins on and the questions will get to Dr. Ponder. Uh, and let me introduce you to uh, the admins that we have on today. Uh, we have Kenny Fox. Uh, I'm not going to ask you all to say hello, but Kenny Fox, Glenn Weber, Cassidy Robinson, Sarah Goya. There's me. There's Mark Oldham, Priscilla Fobel. And I don't know if Carol is on. Carol Vashon. Okay, so uh, honey, this is um, Dr. Ponder. Okay, there you go. Um, let me do a little quick introduction. Dr. Ponder is a board certified pediatric, pediatric endocrinologist from Temple, Texas. In 2018, he received the National AADE Diabetes Educator of the Year Award. Um, and he is the first physician CDE to receive this recognition. They're usually not physicians. Um, I don't think there have been any since. Dr. Ponder's passion for diabetes is fueled by his half century of living well with type 1 diabetes. Yeah, he's one of us uh, since 1966. So I have a year on him. I was diagnosed in 1965. And his deep interest in inspiring others. And by the comments you've been seeing go by this week, you can tell he is a passionate healthcare provider and human being in the diabetes space. He is the creator of Sugar Surfing, which describes the discipline of diabetes self-management in the moment using frequent pattern management enabling, enabled by using your uh, blood glucose monitoring. He also has a, a nonprofit corporation called Dynamic Diabetes Management. The mission is to change how diabetes education is delivered in the era of CGM. Uh, if you want more about that, go to his website. Uh, it is a nonprofit and he does a lot of trainings and it underwrites a lot of his work. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Dr. Ponder. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanne. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all the other wonderful people I see on my screen. So let me get my screen set up if I can and get my talk. There we go. So hopefully you can see, there we go, takes a little, takes a second, there we go, okay. All right, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Okay, um, thank you all for being here uh, today, tonight, this morning, where, wherever you guys are. I think there are people all around the planet and uh, maybe watching this later. Yes, my name is Steve Ponder. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist in Texas. I've had type 1 diabetes for 55 years, as Joanne said. Uh, like her, we're, we're Jocelyn medalists. I, and uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit about uh, uh, what I've learned about dynamic management. And I would hope that you can take some of this and apply it to your looping skills. And uh, I, I, I looked up something that I think is very important for adult learners. And maybe not all eight of these apply to this group, but I will definitely assume that you're all self-directed, uh, that you're all practical and results-oriented. Uh, I'd like to think you're all very open-minded people, but quite honestly, the more, more advanced and more knowledgeable we get, the more kind of narrow we get in the way we, thinking, we think. Uh, I'm surprised that adult learners tend to ha be slower at learning, but I guess not compared to kids. Yet you're, it's e you're, you're spending more time integrating all this knowledge, which is one of the reasons it takes longer. Uh, we also use a lot of our personal experience as a resource, which we all do. 
Uh, and I know everyone here watching and listening is motivated and you have multiple responsibilities. Hence, we're doing this on a Sunday night when probably somebody else is watching the kids and, and doing everything else for you. So you can have an hour to spend with me. And of course, you have this is the one that bugs me the most is that high expectations. Yes, I did worry about this talk because I'm not used to talking to just exclusively loopers because uh, you guys are one of the highest end uh, population of people with diabetes I know of. I have several looping families in my <clears throat> in my practice as well. I'm going to go through what would otherwise be a multi-hour workshop, and I'm going to just hit the highlights, and I'm going to try to drill down on some very key concepts that, that you hopefully can take with you in your looping uh, self-management. First of all, I think we all agree that diabetes is individualized, that we're all unique. Uh, another fundamental question that goes along uh, with diabetes quite often is how dependent are we on uh, the patient to take care of it? Uh, as opposed to the, the provider. Well, I think anybody on this call knows that the patient basically treatment that largely depends on us. Uh, it's amazing in the medical world how often I hear physicians think they control the patient's diabetes. I think that's the height of hubris in so many ways. Uh, but really, we are all in control of our lives and our diabetes. And it's illustrated by this very fact you can find on Google about choices that we make every day. The average person without diabetes makes 35,000 choices each day. That's 12,775,000 choices a year. Now, if you're just talking about food, the average person without diabetes makes about 225 choices each day about them, 82,000 a year. Now, now think about what diabetes does to this, this array of choices that we have to make. So choice is what drives our care. It's the engine that drives our care. Sugar surfing, as I simply define it, is called di Dynamic Diabetes Self-Management, similar to the name of the nonprofit we created, Dynamic Diabetes Management. It's based on frequent pattern management, and you're going to see what that is in, very shortly. It also, what it does, it blends heuristic and reflective thinking. Now, I want to get too fancy with the words here. Heuristic just means shortcuts. Okay, heuristics are mental shortcuts, but I'm, I'm talking about visual mental shortcuts. Reflective thinking, you'll hear, you'll hear more about that as we go through. Now, the basic ingredients for sugar surfing, and I'm a very visual person, as you can see with a lot of my slides, you got to have one of these. I think everybody's got one of these, and, uh, and some of you guys, I think, have two or three of them. You guys are pretty smart. Uh, you need to have at least one of these, got to have one of these, uh, and you got to have a mouth. So you at least have one of these each. You also got to have a CGM, hopefully some knowledge that goes along in that brain, and then either a pump or, as you can see here, an insulin pen. Th these are the basic ingredients for sugar surfing. Uh, but you guys are well above basic. You guys are loopers, okay? So I put this in here. I call it the looping circuit, okay? The looping circuit replaces some of this stuff, and it actually diminishes some of the cognitive uh, burden on the brain. And hence, I made the brain shrink a little bit there. Not completely, not go away, obviously. And many of you might argue that it increases it. I, I, I wouldn't argue with you if you think you actually have to think more, uh, especially with some of the more nuanced things that I, that I hear and see many of you uh, attempt to do to uh, fine tune your management. But this is how I, fra how I frame sugar surfing in the, in the era of looping. Now, let me get straight to the point of what sugar serving is about. I show this in, in my presentations, and some of you have seen this, but I ask you, what do you see here? Now, you see a bunch of dots, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell the audience, what if I connect these dots a little bit, and does that help you determine what I'm showing you? And my point here is that these points can actually define shapes, and this is actually the, uh, the, the Big Dipper, you know, the, uh, the, the constellation Ursa Major, of which the Big Dipper is part of. So my point here is that points can, again, define shapes. Now, the next part of my premise is shapes can be significant. And as you saw there, which I showed very quickly on the screen, I showed you a stop sign. Now, everybody pretty much recognized that instantaneously. So you also assign significance to that shape, just as you would with this uh, yield sign as well. So if points can define shapes, shapes can be significant to you. Now, if you're a medical professional and you're accustomed to reading uh, electrocardiograms, this figure on the left or even on the right uh, can convey information to you, health information, which can actually be life-saving, but you have to have some nomenclature along with it. When somebody first put wires on somebody's chest and traced the electrical uh, uh, activity in it, nobody knew that one was called a P wave or a QRS or an ST or any of this other business. That, was, that occurred later. They had to have some way of being able to intelligently discuss this between providers. Hence, a nomenclature arose. Now, let me get back to diabetes. 
All of these are blood sugar levels, blood sugar numbers. Now, this could have been written on the back of a napkin uh, five or six years ago, or even recently, and handed to a physician and attempted to, and being asked to attempt to make some sort of sense out of that. But what if I take that information and I rearrange it, and I instead of being a series of numbers, I arrange it along a timeline, and I create an image out of it. Now, let me give you something that's a little bit more more uh, dramatic. Same thing, real blood glucose numbers. And let's say they're rearranged along a time axis and on the left-hand side, a glucose uh, level. And here we go. This is something we're all used to seeing now. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on this in terms of CGM data. But then again, look at these structures. And notice I did put, um, I put diagrams here to illustrate key structures I'm going to explain very, very shortly. Now, this is just to show you, somebody asked me what sugar surfing is. I'll show them a 24-hour plot off my, off my uh, CGM just to show this is what I have to do. And I happen to be somebody that likes to highlight things like many of you do. I think that's, that's essential is, is being able to uh, annotate when we can. I'm not sure everybody does, but it does help. And I'll talk about that more as we go on. And it certainly makes it possible for me to make these images to share with you. Now, when I showed this to somebody, somebody mentioned earlier about TCOYD a couple of years ago when I presented this, a woman came up to me and said, gosh, I've had diabetes for like, you know, 20 some odd years and I've been wearing a CGM for quite some time. But the only thing I ever, ten, I ever paid attention to was the glucose number, just the glucose level itself. And she was starting to realize uh, through the discussions that were being uh, provided there at that meeting that the trend arrow had some relevance as well. But after she attended my talk, she, she didn't realize that the trend line itself has a tremendous amount of useful information to it. So even something as simplistic as this, and I have to, I'm going to show another slide that I made especially for uh, one of the members of the group who I know is watching. She's going to, she's going to smile probably on the far left. Our, our, our good friend, uh, Jessica, I, I borrowed, lifted one of her slides just because we had a discussion earlier this week about why don't you use Night Scout or why don't you use, uh, you know, Tide Pool? Well, I said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I said that in one of the questions. Uh, I, have a, I have a 1923 Model T Ford. That's kind of who I am. Uh, it just has a couple of dials up here, but it also has a steering wheel and an and a, and a accelerator and a, and a brake. Uh, it's got what I need, okay? Now, everybody out there, all you loopers and, and are, are, are Tesla folks. You got the Tesla Model 3s, right? Which is great, but you still have a steering wheel, you still have an accelerator, and you still have a brake, okay? So just to make the point is that there are all sorts of different dashboards where you can put additional information, which can be very, very helpful to you in your efforts to manage your diabetes. And I don't dismiss them in the least. In fact, I use SugarMate myself along with my, with my Dexcom, uh, my standard Dexcom app. But I certainly applaud anybody who uses any of the current apps out there uh, that, are, that can put as much data in there as you feel comfortable looking at to make your decisions about self-care. Now, let's get to the process of surfing. It is what you might call a quality improvement process. You have to be able to see a pattern. I'm going to go over that next. You got to be able to see these things. You have to understand and apply a significance filter, if you want to call it that, but say that pattern is significant to me at this moment. You have to then decide how do you respond to that? Do you take action or do you wait? Okay, and then based on whatever you do, you'll follow up again, and hence the cycle just repeats itself. This is sugar surfing. That is basically what it is. It's not a meal plan. It's not using a pump. It's not, I do this on multi-dose insulin. I went back on a pump to, uh, to prove that it worked. It's a decision-making paradigm. That's what it is. Don't make it any more than it isn't. Uh, you guys that loop have all sort of a, sorts of additional tools at your disposal, which I really applaud. And you can take these principles and take them to another level if you use surfing principles, in my opinion. Now, when I went to medical school, I had to go to anatomy class. And that was the first class I took. And I've created a, a, a system of names or nomenclature like I described earlier with the, Q wave, I mean the QRS complex, the T wave and all that with an EKG. Uh, a period of relative stability of a trend line, I like to call a shelf. Now, what do I call relative? I say about 30, point, 30 milligrams per deciliter wide, or those of you that are not in the US, roughly two millimoles uh, wide. And I say over an hour. And I say that's just a basic unit of measure. But keep in mind, a meter is a basic unit of measure, but a millimeter and a centimeter are much smaller, but useful in, in certain situations, just like a kilometer 
is useful in different situations as well. So these are just my core definitions I'm showing with you. So don't get too concrete and literal on how I'm saying about an hour here, because sometimes these can be shorter in length, as you'll see shortly. A delta wave is a period of change that's generally upward, glycemic change that goes up roughly 30 points uh, or more, or two millimoles over a period of an hour. Of course, that could occur in a shorter period of time too. The converse of a delta wave is a drop, again, the same width. And so we have three basic structures, a shelf, a delta wave, and a drop. Now, you can call them whatever you want. You're not gonna get any argument from me. Whatever, whatever floats your boat, whatever makes you happy to use, these are just some terms I use. They're colorful. You can use them. Um, the next three structures are, are more direction uh, related. The pivot. The pivot is a change, a complete change, a reversal in the direction of the trend line, typically um, implemented through the action of insulin and or exercise, although there are people that will say exercise will raise them, and that's why I put a plus minus under that. A carbohydrate pivot is usually when the, when the trend line is dropping and it starts to twist back up, under the influence of some sort of fast-acting carbohydrate or some carbohydrate source. Again, stress could do this, but there are plenty of you out there that can cite me or show me images of stress dropping this as well. So I put a plus minus there. But a pivot is a change in the direction of the line. An inflection is when a steady line just bends in one direction or in the other, unidirectionally, either a downward inflection or an upward inflection, as you see here. <clears throat> the last um, structure, if you will, is really something that's calculated and, and ha requires event markers to, to determine, and that's the lag. And that's the period of time, at least on the grid, from when an action is taken, whether that's insulin, food, um, activity, and when a, an inflection or a change in the direction of flow of the trend line occurs. Okay, this one requires some sort of, uh, of measurement, uh, and it, you need to be able to document what you're doing to be able to get a good idea of what the lag is. Now let me get to this. This is an important image here. This, uh, the eye and the brain here looked at that image on the left and within a split second or two said, that's not right, that's, that's not right. You, you, I force you to think for a second. This is actually what this is. It's that image turned, uh, turned at a 90 degree angle. So images force you to think, much more so in my opinion than numbers do, okay? So when you see these images, and, and, I, and I put three different examples, of uh, the same general upward trend called a delta wave, uh, one going from 190 to 200, another one at the bottom going from 70 to 100, and one in the middle from 90 to 120. Now, when you look at these, they're exactly the same pattern, but they're at different locations, or you might say altitudes, and you have to ask yourself, which of these is significant? The one on the bottom could be significant in that you've treated maybe a low blood sugar, and now it's rising up to a more acceptable level of glycemia. Yet on the other hand, the 190 to 220 would be an unacceptable level of, of change for many people. And the one from 90 to 120 might cause some consternation and the need to maybe look a little bit more frequently afterwards. So significance is dependent on the situation at hand in the moment, as, as, as Joanne introduced when she introduced me. The same thing with a shelf. If you're trending fairly steady from 190 to two, uh, between 190 and 220, that's probably for many of us higher than we want to be, unless we maybe had a toddler or something, but even then that's, that's high. It, on the other hand, 70 to 100 is probably where a lot of you guys are very happy being. You know, uh, I know that a lot of people would prefer, to, in, in my practice, would shoot for 90 to 120, but I know loopers can, can thread a, a tighter line sometimes. So it uh, depends on who you are and what your priorities are as to what you consider significant. Now, likewise, a drop. This is the third structure I showed you. If you're going from 220 to 190, as I show in the top, most of you, most of us would just say the significance of that is I'm dropping, I'm coming down, but I can keep an eye on this one. On the other hand, at the bottom, if I'm going from 100 to 70, uh, I might need to pull out something to slow this down. Uh, and certainly, all of, the, all of you guys with loops, your, your loop's going to step in and do something about this because it's going to see this. It's probably going to also see the one in the middle and start taking some downward action with basal rates, as we all know. So loop takes care of a lot of these things for you in the background. I realize that. This is my basic intro to sugar syruping. So I know that some of these things may not be as big of an issue to you. When you're trying to determine if something is significant, I made a little acronym for this. And if you can remember it, it's, it's great, but it's take care. It's what are you doing right now? What are you currently doing? What are you planning on doing? What have you just done? And how's this size up with things you've done like this in the past? And this sounds like common sense, and it pretty much is, actually, uh, if you apply a little common sense to this. And I think a lot of diabetes care sometimes is common sense once we get into the world of sugar surfing. 
but current, anticipated, recent, and experience, and in your experience. But keep in mind that omissions are extremely important, okay? People don't give enough credit to the act of omission. I, I always give two examples of that. Omit your insulin. Take your insulin and omit your meal. Well, those are do-nothing actions which could have profound impacts on your control. Just keep that in mind. So omissions have, can carry just as much weight as proactive actions. Now, so the three Ds, if you will, of sugar serving are to get comfortable recognizing drifts, deltas, and drops. I've already shown you what these, these guys look like. Now, and again, this is another uh, mnemonic, visual mnemonic. The first thing to do when you sugar serve is, is you have to be able to see something. You've got the glance at the trend line. It's only then you can see the patterns, apply any significance to them, and decide on whether to act or not act, okay? This is about my only technical slide. I pulled this off a, a paper from last year that showed the frequency of glancing, or actually scanning. I just put glancing because that's my catchword for this. The more often you glance at your trend line, and this is not loopers uh, that we're talking about, just people that are, uh, that are uh, wearing a CGM, the lower your A1C, the fewer the highs you have, the more time and range, a very important measure that we all believe in, I think, uh, fewer lows, fewer severe lows, fewer extreme lows. So there's a tremendous benefit up from awareness alone, whether you use loop, whether you use a pump, whether you use MDI. And this is what this, this illustrates. Now, here we have Curious George. What are some of the triggers that would make us look, okay? Now, just like George, we might just be curious. When we first got our sensors, we probably looked at them a lot. We probably looked at them quite a bit because they were new. It was a new experience. We wanted to look at it and then we re remembered all the stuff we didn't have to do, all the finger poking we didn't have to do to get a piece of information. And that finally settled down into something more reasonable in terms of the number of times we checked every day. But after you get past that, you'll, you, you, you'll develop some triggers for when you do actually look. And that may be when you have that sensation of feeling low, high, or something changing, you know? And there's, uh, most of us, I think, that have worn sensors for any length of time have developed that capability. Not everybody, but uh, it does happen for a lot of people who, who may not have thought they had that capacity. Or it may be the situation. Uh, a meal or some event or some stress, there may be some things that trigger my desire to look at my trend line. Now I'm showing you actual, now an actual uh, a six hour trend line off my CGM. And these are little eyeballs symbols here. I, I just wanna show you. But keep in mind where I put the eye right here, really that's, that's when I look, I'm looking backwards as what, as from what was there behind me. And as you can see, ignore everything to the right of that, of that first eyeball. What I see is a shelf. I highlighted that for you, a period of stability. Uh, the next time the eyeball looks, I'm starting to see a little bit of a change here, but it's not significant enough for me to make any action. If it's gone up from 85 to 92, that could just be wobble within the sensor or, or all sorts of things. But I decided to look a little bit later, probably about 45 minutes, but now, aha, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a delta wave. I'm seeing an inflection. So this shelf, inflected into a delta wave. I think you can all see that. Well, I've made it pretty easy for everybody to see. And based on that information, a decision was made, and don't worry about how I got the, the, the amount, but I gave a certain amount of insulin, okay? There was a, actually a bit of a lag time, and I don't show that here, but that's what this represents before the impact actually slowed down the rise. And then I moved into another so-called shelf. And again, I looked at it here. So I watched it a little bit longer because I, did, I wanted to see what would happen. Maybe, maybe it's, it'd be premature to act right now. And, and that was a good choice because when I got, when I got here, I had actually taken a couple of units of insulin because I wanted to bring it down at that point. And by the time I got here, I brought it down to where I wanted it to be. And there's a term for this I'm going to show you in a minute. I'm going to give you the heads up. This is what I call a drop, a drop move or taking the drop move. And it's a tiny one. It's a, using a micro bolus or a small amount of insulin. But on this steady trend line, I decided that it was worthy enough to take a small additional uh, dose of insulin to drop this down and also factor in uh, a certain amount of, uh, of uh, carbohydrates if I wanted to take some later. And sometimes that's a meal. I'll show you one in the future when I actually take a dose about an hour ahead of time and catch the meal on the drop. In this case, I was trying to take a pure drop move and have it level out but I had to take a couple of five gram carbohydrate breaks. I had to tap the brakes, if you will, remember the car metaphor, uh, and then to level that out right about here, okay? Um, this was a walk, and I do walk, 
And I do use the walks uh, uh, to manage my blood sugar as well. Somebody brought that up in one of the questions. I use walking and exercise as, as a management tool. Uh, I think most everybody listening to this, I would like to think do that. And at each point of these times when I have the eyeball, I'm looking back to see what, what had happened. And notice by the time uh, this picture was taken around seven o'clock, I'd been on a shelf for about an hour and a half, nice and steady. And I had not actually looked anywhere in here because I had not felt any shifting up or down in my blood sugars. So I walked you through my thought process for this particular image and why I did what I did. Now, some of you may not have, would not have done any of this, or, or at this point, perhaps Loop would have picked things up as that delta wave was occurring. In all likelihood, it would have, and that would have probably brought this thing back down. So this is what you would do in the absence of Loop, and I think in this case, Loop would have done a good job for you guys. Now, my checklist, and I love checklists uh, out there, but my glancing checklist, and Loop can help you with a lot of this stuff, I know that. Where you are in glycemic space, what your altitude, how high your blood sugar is, what direction it's moving, and how fast it's changing, Loop's got your back on that one totally. I totally got that. What you've done, what have you done recently? Well, for those of you that enter your data into your devices, uh, which I know not everybody does, I have patients who don't do that, and they're usually teenagers, uh, but if, they're, if you're uh, actively doing that, then uh, Loop has your back on that too. Now, what Loop can't really do is know what you're going to do next. It doesn't know the future all that well. Uh, you can predict and maybe plan some things ahead. And, and I know that some of you guys do that will make adjustments in anticipation of something, but the Loop's not going to be able to do that. You have to step in and do it for the Loop. I got that, okay? Last, uh, the, the fourth one is what has experience taught me? You may have done this walk or this run or this Taekwondo if you're Jessica, you know, 5,000 times, right? You know, and so experience has taught you certain things that you can't ignore and you shouldn't ignore. You should factor this into your decision making. And then you finally have to make that decision. Uh, are you going to act or not act? Now, Loop will do some of those actions for you, but if you want to be more aggressive than Loop, then you have to make some decisions and to either uh, disable it or modify it so you can step in and do that. And I did see a post today, and I can't remember who, did, who posted it, uh, one of your more advanced leaders in the group who discussed making some adjustments and uh, even taking an intramuscular regular shot or, or maybe some other fast-acting form of insulin or Freza or something else, and then modifying the loop protocols, uh, the, the loop uh, programming uh, to allow that effect to kick in faster. So that's a much higher end function that I can't address because I'm not a looper. Uh, but I, I, I applaud all you guys who have all that, te that technical expertise. Um, and then, you know, you, you, what actions you plan on doing uh, next? You, Loop can't do that for you. You, you can say, I'm going to exercise for 30 minutes, and then 30 minutes later, you get a call from the office. You got to leave. You have to make some changes. So Loop can do only so much. You may, have, you may be able to turn it off faster than you could with me when I took a shot to do something. But remember, Loop can do a lot of this stuff, but it can't do all of it for you, Okay. Now, there are four core sugar surfing moves I want to talk about and want you to get comfortable with. There's the pivot. I showed you that earlier, whether it's an insulin pivot or a carbohydrate pivot. Um, there's the drop move, as you see here, that S curve, that, and, or that reverse S curve. And then this S, S curve, which I tend to call a nudge because I'm usually not trying to take it up all that much. Okay? Uh, and the nudge is going from a lower level of, of stability to a higher level of stability. That's really what I'm aiming at here, as opposed to going from a higher level of stability down to a lower level of stability, as I showed you earlier with the drop move. Okay? Now, this is a quiz, and I can't show, ask for a show of hands, so I have to walk you through it. What sugar surfing move do you see here? Okay. Now I'm not highlighting anything, but I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. This 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 trend line here would be called the shelf, right? That's what we call it. That's what I call it. You can call it whatever you want to. Straight line, whatever. Okay. Well, 155. I didn't want to be there. Okay. So I decided to take a discrete amount of insulin to bring that down. Okay. And as you can see, it took about two hours or so for that to occur. There was a lag time between here and here when they actually started to see a, a significant fall. And then this inflected and leveled off into another shelf here. So I have a drop. I have a shelf, a drop, and a shelf, an inflection, and an inflection. Those are the basic structures. And uh, now, those of you guys, and, and again, I know you guys, the loopers, you guys would have had a basal rate that would have brought this down more gradually. Got that. Got that. Okay, so, but if you're not a looper, this is how we, this is how we do it. We give a discrete amount of insulin to bring that down. This is called taking the drop, taking the drop, okay? So, real quick review, real quick review. What are these things that I have shown in orange? What do I call those? I call them drops, okay? 
And you can see these are, different, are of different sizes and shapes. What do I call these red triangles that are upward moving? I call those delta waves. What do I call these periods of relative stability? They're not perfect straight lines, but they're generally stable over a period of time. And those are different periods of time. Shelves, okay? Drops, deltas, and shelves. Now, the arrows are pointing to changes in direction, which I call inflections, not full reversals. Inflections, okay? And then I see three, I count three, pivots or complete changes of direction, okay? I didn't show the lags in this one, but those are your core uh, structures you can see visually with the naked eye if you train your eye to look for them, okay? So my points to ponder, yes, that's a pun. Um, each glance might change your interpretation. Think about your driving your car and you see a, a, an alignment of vehicles in front of you. How quickly can that change? Well, anybody that drives know that changes, that can change in a heartbeat. So the same principle applies when you're looking at a trend line. Things can change. So the more times you glance, the more opportunities you have to make an assessment. Is that pattern stable? Is it worthy of my attention and doing something about it? Or is it changing so much I need to be more conservative and wait and hold back? Basic shapes can and will morph into new ones, okay? And as I showed you in one of that, early, that earlier slide as I was going through sequentially, that some of those shapes would have changed over time compared to what you thought they were at the very beginning, okay? Train your eye, this is the key. Train your eye to see the basic shapes I've talked about and appreciate those lag times. I look for lag times whenever I'm, I'm taking an action with insulin or food. And if I don't see them happen in a reasonable period of time, that forms part of my decision-making about whether I should take a secondary or tertiary action uh, on that trend. Event markers can help you, as we've already talked about. You all have different dashboards you can use. I encourage you to use them. Not everybody does. In fact, the vast majority of people I know that use sensors are not loopers, and, they're, and I have to encourage them to do that. I think I'm speaking to the choir here on event marker use. You guys are doing that. So you're going to get much more, more information out of your devices that way. Be conservative in your actions at first. And I'm sure you were all that way when you went into looping. You were conservative until you got comfortable with the technology. And then you started making some uh, more bolder moves or making some changes. In sugar surfing, it's the same thing. Be conservative. Have patience. Make, make sure that whatever changes you see, uh, you are comfortable that the action you're taking is without question necessary. Uh, you don't get to that point of predicting or preempting things until you get a little bit more advanced. And I'll show you some slides about that later. Learn to, re learn to read that trend line. That trend line is telling you something. Once you can look at it and glance at it and see it, especially what's happened in the last 30 minutes to an hour or so, you're golden. You're golden. This is dynamic diabetes management as I see it, okay? Now, I'm going to show you this. As I showed you earlier, this, this viewpoint is the first viewpoint. Nice steady shelf, right? Second viewpoint, that shelf is now morphed into a small drop. Okay, the next time I'm looking at this, notice that there's been a small, a tiny little pivot, upward delta wave, an inflection back to a shelf. Notice what I see now, just a, you know, an hour or so later. The next view, this is now inflected into a, into a delta wave. Okay, delta wave is continuing. Over here, as you can see, I'm now seeing a drop after a lag and a pivot and the reason for that drop, of course, is because a decision had, made, had been made at a couple of these other points when the delta wave was rising to take a dose of, of, of insulin, to, a pivot dose of insulin to turn that line around, okay? And again, I'll, I'll, for total transparency, loops would have picked this up in here based on their predictive algorithms and started to increase these and bring them back. I got that. Uh, so again, sugar serving has a lot of looping. Uh, I mean, uh, looping has a lot of sugar serving just baked into it, as we all know. And lastly, this last one is that whole uh, six-hour picture. And you can see that drop has come down further. And let's go on to the next slide, into the next time frame. And in this case, that, that, uh, that slowed down, leveled off into a shelf, as you can see here from that drop. And then the final view on a steady shelf. Now, I'm not going to go through the specific actions that were done in here, but that's the interpretation. And the point being is every time you look, you're going to see a slightly different, you potentially could see a slightly different landscape. And I know Loop does that for you constantly. And that's, you know, so when Loop's not working or you decide to get off Loop for a while, uh, this is where you can step in. Or if Loop's not picking it up for you fast enough, that's when you can start making decisions. Do I want to be more aggressive than Loop? Do I feel comfortable doing that? And you have your, your, your expert teams out there that are more than happy, it seems like, to give you advice on what to do with that. 
and I applaud that, that, that resource. Now, glancing tips. When you're looking at the trend line, I, you know, this is the classic Star Wars. I've got a bad feeling about this, right? And how many of you guys can feel your lows coming on? Feel you're just dropping? Now, I can. I didn't think I could do that when I got on my sensor a, a long time ago, but within a year or so, I could really feel those drops well before they got low. But looking at your trend line is, is an art form, in my opinion. Uh, you can look at it whenever you want to, of course, but try to think tactically. I tend to look at mine half an hour before I eat, half, half an hour before I think something's going to happen. I just glance at it. I look at it when I, before I get in the car, while I'm driving, before, before I come into the office. I just kind of glance at it. Mine's easy to look, look at because I keep, I'm, again, I'm a dinosaur. I've got, I've got my receipt, my Dexcom receiver on my belt loop open to the, just flopping, flopping down. I just have to push the button. I don't have to get my phone out, unlock the code. I could put it on my watch. The watch actually takes a second to sync up with the phone. It's actually easier for me, at least, to wear the receiver. I know it's redundant, but it gives me instantaneous information. If you have a better, a faster method, I'm all for it. Fluidly set alerts and alarms to prompt you if you need. When I'm trying to shoot the gap, shoot a very narrow gap, I will set uh, lower alert alarms higher or the higher alarms lower, uh, make the alarms louder. Uh, so if I'm busy seeing a patient or if I'm doing something important that I get alerted, okay? And, if, and I'll do it at night sometimes. I do tend to wake up with my alarms. I know not everybody does that, but I'm used to waking up the phone calls and such being on call. Uh, the one in the third, uh, sec, uh, third check is use the force loop, and that's the sixth sense. I, I, I like to think that a lot of you probably, if I asked or took a poll, can feel a drop. Not a low, but a drop. Uh, and likewise, you can probably feel a, a, a rise, too. Uh, there's just that sensation, that bodily sensation we tend to have. We also know what, know what relative stability feels like, too, when something's going steady. And uh, that's also a nice thing to use to prompt you to actually look. And in practice guessing, I put this in the book, is just call it the, the sensor game if you have a kid, uh, not in a gotcha method, but before you push that button, say, am I going straight? Am I trending up or am I trending down? I did that for about six months, and I became 99% accurate in, in being able to tell the general direction before I even looked at it. And I they couldn't always tell exactly what the, what the altitude was, but actually over time, I've gotten pretty good with that too. That, that took a few years longer to actually tell if I'm between 70 and 80 or 70 and 90 versus 120 and 130. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm about 75% accurate with that. I'm 95, 99% accurate with ups, downs, or sideways. And it's, I think it's pretty cool. Okay, this is just a cluster of 24-hour of plots just to show people that every day is different. I'm very good at annotating my insulin doses in purple, my, my, the hatches of my long acting. I take Traceva. Uh, and then the circles are various carbs and meals and so on, you know, carb, uh, um, you know, uh, carb tabs or whatever. Um, and you can see every day is different. Some days uh, you have some pretty interesting changes. Some days you have very simple, very straightforward stuff. This, this probably looks like it was on a loop, I guess, perhaps, although there's insulin associated with that. Notice I just took two, unit, two doses of insulin that day plus a long acting. On other days, I can take nine or ten. Uh, it just varies. Every day is different. Every day is unique. And it brings me to my philosophical point. You can't stop the waves unless you're dead, uh, but you can learn to surf, okay? Now, the core concepts of what I'm going to show you in, those, in the examples for the rest of the hour is you got to be able to recognize these patterns and assign significance to them. We've talked about that. You're really managing a situation. Just like in driving a car, you're managing a situation, a destination, around surrounding traffic, your speed, the kids screaming in the back of the car, all that stuff. You're managing a situation, not just blood sugar, food, and insulin. Uh, preempting things is preventing things. And again, Loop does a great job with, with preempting, in my opinion. Uh, Chain-dependent insulin dosing, I'll talk a little bit about that. That's called eye chaining That used to have the evil word of stacking in the past. I don't use that word. Uh, this is basically uh, overlapping insulin doses by design. Um, knowing insulin in food is not a constant. This is my one rub I have with, with a lot of the engineers of the world, is that there's a tendency to want all of this to be uh, something that can be boiled down to a mathematical formula. And that gets close, but there's plenty of chaos. And I'm a student of chaos and randomness. And if, if you cannot get that out of the universe. And it's going to be part of our diabetes, and we have to be prepared for it. Uh, so things like insulin action, food action, there's a lot of things you, you have to be able to deal with that are, that are ambiguous. Uh, and as much as I wish I could beat it all out of diabetes, and I know you do too, uh, it's kind of hard to. Okay, remember, you're trying to steer a trend. You're not just reacting to a number. 
And this is going to come up a little bit later, but you're trying to blend style with substance. Let me give you a, a preview of that. Substance are the programming steps. Substance is your software. Substance is your, is your you know, the, all the numbers and all the values, your ratios, your basal rates, and so on. Substance could be the amount of carbs you, you, uh, you ingest, your carb on board formula, all that. Style is a totally different thing. And substance without style is only half of the, uh, half the equation. Style when you do things, how you do things, how often. There's all sorts of things we can talk about with style, and I'll try to touch on that before the end of the talk. Now, I have to do a shout out for time and range. Everybody knows that the world is moving to time and range. Uh, set A1Cs are nice, and everybody seems to use that, unfortunately, as a report card. I try not to, uh, but these, all these individuals, in theory, have an A1C of seven. Yet the person on the right has 100% of, of his or her readings between 70 and 180, uh, that 100% time and range. Most of you guys are showing me your loop patterns or, or, or rocking that or, or higher, uh, which I think is fantastic. Time and range is the bomb. And that's going to be what the research studies are going to be tying to long-term outcomes and everything else under the sun that used to be just the sole purview of the A1C. So just this shows you a 7% A1C tells you not a whole lot about time and range, okay? Glance often, glance smartly, keep your eye on that line. Try to see about an hour ahead when you're looking at these trend lines. Remember that insulin wears off and food wears off and you have to be able to learn to tell the difference between the two. That's where inflections come in. If deltas drops and um, um, shelves are the, you know, the, 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 uh, the words, uh, inflections are grammar, uh, pivots are grammar, if you wanna use that metaphor. Uh, trend line significance is always defined in the moment. And I've shown you examples of that, how the moment shifts and changes the interpretations. Rapid acting insulin effects can be overlapped. It's called chain dependent insulin event management. That's my fancy word for eye chaining. And as I said earlier, just a second ago, stress and chaos happen. They're basically like glycemic rip currents you have to deal with. Now let me show you some examples for the rest of the talk here, okay? Classic example, I use this to illustrate the core features here. And in this, in this case, I'm teaching you about a situation. But notice that you have a shelf over here that inflects to a delta wave. And then at a, approximately this point in time, right here is when awareness occurs because I was asleep then, it's four o'clock in the morning. And so yours truly wakes up and sees, looks back and sees this big delta wave. But notice at 145, it was fairly steady. Okay, what's that all about? That's a whole nother discussion. That could be a late acting food. Um, that's not, that's not a dawn phenomenon because I'm, I'm about 64, so that can't be me. But, uh, but it's, it was a late action of food, okay, that had been eaten many hours earlier and the insulin I'd taken for it had, had petered out. Now, again, I'll, I sound like a broken record. Your loop would have picked this up somewhere in here and would have brought it on back down. Okay, so I probably shouldn't believe you too much on this uh, based on, on the fact you're all loopers, but just to show you the points. This, at this point, a decision had to be made about what to do. So a dose of insulin was taken, and then the rest of the structures I normally show you appeared. There's a lag time. Uh, you can see how many dots passed between then and when it actually pivoted down. A drop occurred, and then this insulin wore off right about here, right about here, and it leveled off into a shelf. Now, I'm going to say... And this is going to, this may ruffle a few feathers out there. It says insulin duration, but what I like to call this is the effective, okay? Effective. I don't think this will show up here very well, but effective insulin duration. I can get people to send me all sorts of papers. They'll say, no, ponder, your insulin lasts longer than just that long. It's in there. I'm not arguing that, but its effect on lowering my blood sugars is not evident based on this, and that's what matters. So it's the effective insulin duration, but I can actually see that based on when this dose was taken and when this inflects because it's not driving me down, okay? So whatever's still in there is balanced out now with that insulin. So as long as I keep watching the trend line um, and maintaining that shelf, then this is the insulin duration I'm looking at. And it's roughly two, uh, one and a half to two hours for me when I'm using regular insulin. Not FIAS, not Lumjev, not IM anything, not Afreza, okay? This is, I use straight up uh, Humalog, okay? So again, I'm, I'm driving the Model T, guys. Remember that, remember that, okay? Now, I know pizza is an evil word for many people out there, okay? Especially those of you that are in the low-carbohydrate community. I'm not here to offend anybody, okay? This is just, I, I do try some things 
I'm not a big pizza maven, but I do like to eat hamburgers and pizza from time to time. I like to live a normal life as much as I can, but I don't go overboard, okay? So I, I can live that life of moderation, which I think is important, okay? So in this case, uh, a pizza is eaten around about three o'clock in the afternoon, as you can see. I estimated based on what I read that it was about 66 grams, which is about two slices for that size pizza and the crust size. So I decided to take roughly six units for that. Um, and notice that after two hours, there's actually a little bit of a dip here, but then it starts to inflect up. I didn't have anything else to eat except those two pieces of pepperoni pizza. And about two hours later, that, in, that delta wave starts to kick in. And that's my cue. When that, when that two hours is up and that, that insulin uh, level seems to be fading relative to the duration of action of that pizza, I pick that up early. Now, this is a preemptive move, okay? Now, I'm not sure, and maybe some of our experts out there could tell me if loop would pick up a 113. It might. It might say it's going to be up here in this amount of time, and I'm going to do something. Uh, but what's happening here in my case is I have decided that I'm going to take a step-down dose because it's a pizza, and I've had lots of pizzas in the past, and notice I, I created a pivot, classic pivot, okay, a little bit of a lag time, drop, and then which inflected back into a shelf. Now, that took about one hour and 45 minutes before that inflection occurred, which to me represented the termination of the effect of that four units, just as if this two hours reflected the termination of that six units. Now, I'm not going to run off and say two hours is how long my insulin lasts. I'm, I'm formulating a range of responses, okay? I don't believe in precision in the way this world works because there's so much randomness and chaos built into the system. But I can see with my eyes I'm on a period of stability. So, again, that's surfing a pizza. I did not have to take a third... Uh, a third dose. So those are my three situations. The first situation was going into the food. The second one was th managing through the food. And the last one was after the food effect was over, those three situations. And the one that required the most effort was situation two, as you can see. Now, when I went to um, Portland, Oregon, um, Shelby Ivy asked me, took me out to dinner after the workshop, and they did a challenge. They took me out to this place I'd never been to before, and they fed me this food. Which you can't really tell what it is, pork ribs, fries, and coleslaw. I don't eat this stuff usually, but they, they put it out there. There were two uh, diabetes educator uh, dietitians who counted the carbs on the plate, and they, they told me what it was. So before I even knew what was coming out, I knew they were going to hammer me, hammer me with some carbs, okay, and something pretty interesting. So I took a, uh, I took a dose of insulin up front. Uh, pre preloaded, pre-dosed of uh, five units. And once I had the whole load of food on my plate, I took four more and I started personally with a one to 10 ratio. That's just kind of what I usually start out with. It's easier. I got 10 fingers and you know, I, I, I'm not real smart, but I can do that. And so, um, so you can see what happened is I, it went down and pivoted up and it quickly started to have a delta wave at which point I figured, well, whatever, the, whatever's in there, the fries are usually my kryptonite. Uh, I took, an, I took a, a, a step down dose. I took three units less than nine. That leveled it off, as you can see, into a shelf, inflected into a shelf. And then I felt it starting to go up. So again, I preempted another, I preempted this for another five units. Just say I took another dose. And again, it went up and then I took another. This was just like not ending. This is a never ending rise, right? And I took a larger dose. This is where I went kind of went, uh, went Rambo here on this one. And then I took the dose and of course that pivoted and then it dropped and it came down and it inflected without any carbohydrate stoppage or break or anything um, around two o'clock in the morning to about 116. Now, the funny thing about this, the funniest part of the story is I told Shelby when she put this on the plate, I said, you know what? I looked at the meal and it's like giving her an estimate on her busted up car. And I said, I think this is going to take about eight hours of my effort to do this, for me to do it. Now, I know that you guys on the loops, the loops would pick a lot of this stuff up, but uh, it took about eight hours, which I thought was kind of interesting, interesting prediction. So again, my first situation is I was on a nice steady shelf, relatively speaking, and then I had to deal with this. This was the work. This was the work to do that. Now, if I ate this food all the time, and was, and this is one of my favorite meals, I'll guarantee you it wouldn't look like that the next time, uh, because this experience would be folded into the next attempts. Just saying, that's what sugar serving is about. It's not repeating the first time, it's using the first experience to make a better second experience. And I've shown those in previous posts in the past, okay? So again, let's get back to situational management. Point of view, POV1. That's the first thing I see right here. It, this is at two o'clock in the morning. Notice I see a very, very slight, tender uh, delta wave coming up. Uh, and I decide to take a microbolus. This is a microbolus uh, experiment. Uh, notice it levels off and forms a shelf. And I go back to sleep, okay? I'm, I'm, but I'm hovering right above 140. And then 
I wake up a little bit later around five o'clock. I get up early. I get up around five o'clock. So I did wake up. This is when I woke up. And then I looked back and I saw this starting to trend up. So I had another little shelf. I figured this in, this two units was completely gone by now. And so I took another five units. This is for my breakfast that's over here, okay? But I wanted to drop that. So I took a drop move, right? Remember I told you taking the drop off this shelf. This had inflected into a shelf actually. And then it dropped. And then after I had my meal, that caused an inflection back into another shelf. So that's, that's style. That's waiting. That's, uh, uh, that's timing. Uh, it's not just, you know, adding up the carbs, taking a shot, and, uh, and, uh, and eating. eating. It, there's, there's, there's nuance to it. And so this is my first um, uh, uh, part, uh, segment, my second, third segment, and is my fourth segment. So these are the, the thought processes in all these uh, uh, periods of time. And, of course, as you see in the last one, I'm back in, in my steady range, and I'm, back, I'm at the office doing my work. Now, my middle daughter had a birthday, and just for grins, um, and I'm going to be totally transparent with you guys. I, I decided to, what the hell? I'm going to try pizza. I'm going to try a whole pizza. I, I, I was, can, I, can I do this? You know, would this work? I, it's not like, it's like climbing Mount Everest, right? But I did a pizza challenge. I took a whole 12 inch pizza and just tore that thing up. Okay. And I just started sugar surfing it. Here's where I, here's where I stumbled and made a pro and, and had a problem. I should have done it earlier and at a different time of the day. Cause notice I did it at six o'clock. And I did all the moves you've seen me show before. Uh, two hour, waited, saw the delta wave, took a secondary dose, leveled off. And this is kind of a dirty shelf, you want to call it a shelf. Uh, three hours later, now it's 12 o'clock. Yours truly made the mistake of falling asleep, believe it or not. I do sleep. And so, and notice what happened, delta wave, okay? And I was asleep. So I, I woke up. Um, I woke up at three o'clock in the alarm. I, I was really, it was a birthday party for my daughter. And, um, and so here I saw that I said, well, I'm going to act on that. So I take a, a, a pivot dose. I wait 50 minutes for that, uh, 50 minutes. And it finally levels off into a shelf and it stays a shelf for 60 minutes. So I'm thinking now that ain't turning around. I just stopped the rise. I just stopped it. Okay. I need to take an, I need to do a double tap here. Okay. So what I did was, you can see, I got a little bit more aggressive because this is way up there on the level, on the number scale. So I took a little bit more than the first one, six. And as you can see, classic drop move. Okay. And then on top of that, I took, I had my, I had some yogurt the next morning, but that was how I uh, recovered from that. Okay. So even the greatest basketball players uh, uh, have to, you know, uh, they, they, they make the bad, bad throws. The uh, greatest football player quarterbacks uh, throw interceptions. Uh, the secret's not, not throwing interceptions. It's being able to recover uh, from that kind of performance. Uh, and that's how I look at this. This is not a failure. This is a recovery. And I think that's what sugar serving is about too. Okay. Now, this is just a, a funny quote I like to share. This is, if you, this is really an old movie now, The Matrix. And this is from Cypher, if you ever watched it. I, think it. I love this quote. There's way too much information to decode The Matrix. You get used to it, though. Your brain does the translating. I don't even see the code now. All I see is blonde, brunette, redhead. Uh, hey, do you want a drink? You know, that's, that, I like that quote because all this information looks overwhelming, but you get to a point where you can just see it. Okay, and you know you can cluster it. You can make sense out of the things that are there to make good decisions with it. Okay, timing. Oh crap, was that today? The dinosaurs looking at the Noah's Ark, as you can see there. This is an old slide. I put this on here just to make a point that timing of insulin is typically a very beneficial thing. Pre-bolusing is what we've tended to call it. It's getting that insulin on board before rather than after, and the effects that it have on what happens after that subsequently are much better because you lower the amount of rise that occurs after a meal if you take the insulin and the meal together. Now, there are plenty of exceptions to that, especially with slow-acting carbohydrate meals. Um, even fast-acting meals may require an even longer period of time before the meal uh, in order to get that, that insulin on board. But timing of insulin is a, uh, is a style thing that's very important. And as I mentioned earlier, style is very important. The reason why we want to minimize those rises after meals, and this is another old slide, is to recognize that when our A1C is down in the low level, less than 7.3, that 70% of it comes from our after meal or our postprandial blood sugar levels. Whereas when we have a 10.2 or higher, it's the other way around. So many of us who don't appreciate that are not really controlling the after meal rises sufficiently enough if we're looking at lower A1C values 
uh, and, and, and missing an opportunity by not better synchronizing food and insulin, okay? Here's some just classic examples from some previous slides I had, which show timing of insulin relative to the food, and then a fairly nice, steady, minimal rise in the blood glucose line afterwards. This is one where, again, this is chaos. I remember I told you I love chaos because it's everywhere, it's all around us. Okay, chaos. I, I got a phone call here on the phone next to me, and, and normally I would have eaten my meal uh, within about 20 minutes, after I took that dose. And notice I got 40 minutes and then the insulin start, the blood sugar started dropping. It was getting a head of steam behind it. I had my, my, my small meal and it went down and it just went down to 95, but then it inflected back up. And then when it leveled off here at about 120 minutes, my assumption was that that insulin effect had pretty much worn off relative to the food that was in my system. But I, I, I made a graphic out of this to say, well, what if I'd taken it about 25 minutes earlier, I might've had a different may have had a different result, okay? So timing is so important for a lot of things we eat. And this particular meal was something I ate a lot of. And so I knew it uh, uh, more, more, it had a more consistent effect than many things I eat. It became one of my top 10 foods. And without going into great detail, you, the things you eat a lot, you kind of get, you get to know, you know, how they work, how quickly they kick in, and you can practice them to some extent. Now you can't get totally precise, but you can use that that top 10 list uh, when you're trying to make decisions uh, and gives you a bit of a head up, heads up on whatever you're up against, okay? And this is to show you that insulin onset times vary. Again, I think you've all learned that by now, that 35 minutes, 45 minutes, I showed you one that was an hour uh, before anything substantial happened. So I'm looking for the inflections or the delta waves to tell me uh, if my insulin that I took was going to have any significant impact. And I generally am waiting at least 30 minutes in most cases uh, if I'm looking for this. And, some, and if I'm not sure, I'll wait an hour, as I showed you before, or even longer. And when you're first doing this, <clears throat> feel free to relay as long as possible before you decide whether that dose worked or that, 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 uh, that bolus dose worked or not. Now, eye chaining is based on estimating your own effective, and I remember I made a big deal about that word, effective duration of insulin action. Uh, and what you're trying to do is to preempt or prevent a rise uh, that, lasts long, that, that lasts longer than your last or previous rapid acting insulin dose by virtue of the fact that insulin has a certain duration of action. It's a range, I got that. But the meals and the foods we eat can often have much broader ranges of action. And knowing how to match these up is a secret of sugar surfing, especially if you're doing it with multi-dose insulin. Again, back to, the, back to the loop. Loopers have the ability to start picking that up and they will try to buffer that with basal adjustments and or, or partial corrections, uh, depending on what technology you're using. So I think that's great. And those are all basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're forms of eye chaining, if you will, that have been, been embedded into the software. And you guys, I know, can modify this all you want. And you do, and you do a very good job with it. Um, assuming your food intake is complete and you're not nibbling or at the golden corral, then uh, you know, your follow-up dosages are usually tapered down. But you saw my example. I didn't do it in every case. Sometimes I had a reason for not doing it, but usually I will taper uh, uh, the doses down compared to the first one, just so you know. Okay? Eye chains are like an insulin relay race. That's my metaphor. Uh, and so knowing that lag time, as you probably saw, mine's about an hour and 45 minutes to about two and a half hours. I start looking for something going up about two hours or so. If I start seeing something go up and I knew the food I ate uh, was more likely to cause that, I'm more prone to make a decision to take a preemptive uh, step, preemptive move. And again, I'm not sure if Loop would pick this stuff up at the levels that I'm acting at now, because I'm doing it right at the inflection when you're still well in the normal range. That's the one thing that I'd probably do that Loop can't do quite yet, okay? Um, so I, I learned an inflection hunt. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking when I glance at a line. Um, and I'm also mindful of the basal insulin running in the background. Now, if you had 15 basal rates running at different rates, you might have more uh, tailwind. I use the, the metaphor tailwind pushing you forward or less tailwind pushing you forward. But in my case, because I take a single dose of long-acting insulin, a bit less of that effect for me. But for many of you, your pumps are constantly adjusting uh, based on the prevailing glucose levels and trending. Um, also consider the type and amount of meal that you're eating too. Uh, and that's important to, to, know, to know. When I go to have a Thanksgiving meal or a New Year's meal, I've got a lot of food in me. I'm going to have to be much more aggressive. And again, eye chaining is not a beginner move for a sugar surfer. Now, you guys may get, be able to do a lot of it more with looping, but you, none of you are beginners to be loopers in my opinion. You're all pretty advanced people. 
this is how I diagram this stuff out. <clears throat> if I'm doing this with multi-dose insulin, notice that I show on the top uh, a big mountain of carbohydrate effect, a big, and the bolus insulin is underneath it. Now, if I just took one dose of bolus insulin, it starts to, to taper off here. That's when I see that inflection point. That's how I perceptualize that because now that insulin's fading and that, that food is still present and it's pushing me up. So hence, I take a second bolus and then that pivots it back down and brings it back down. And these two, hopefully these two boluses of insulin together are, are enough to cover the width of that, of that carbohydrate rise that you see up above. Now, it could be something even longer effect and it would take even a third dose of insulin too. So it just depends on the situation, okay? Now, if you're on a pump, of course, that has the, the ability to adjust basils or if you just do a standard dual way bolus, then you can do all of this up front if you want to, once you understand what food it is. You know, give a certain percentage up front and give the rest as a tail. Uh, or if your loop does it automatically in, uh, while in the background, great. So that's another strategy to deal with this. In the book, I, this is actually in the book, uh, an old slide, but I just use it as an example. I was running a pump at this time just to make an example here. Uh, breakfast challenge. I did the same meal three days in a row just to show you how I'd take something on new. In this case, I had uh, Honey Nut Cheerios. As I tell people in the talks, I sacrificed my body with Honey Nut Cheerios. I did it three days in a row and survived it, okay? So I was using a Peter at the time in my Del Deltec, V-E-L-T-E-C, my wonderful Deltec pump. I love it. Uh, and so I, I took I counted out 56 grams of carbs for the, for the milk and the, and the, and the, uh, the cereal. I waited for the, the inflection, which I call the bend, which tells me the insulin's working. When the line dips down after a dose, I call that the bend. It's a word I use in the book, waiting for the bend. Uh, and it's an inflection, basically. And then I had my meal. I ate in about five, two or three minutes, right? I whipped it down pretty quick. And notice, really, what happened fairly quickly is I had this big delta wave that occurred. So I decided to preempt it. Uh, with a little less than what I took, five units, because this really shot up pretty quick. It turned into a shelf, and I went ahead and took another five units and then brought it down, okay? So this was all while running a basal rate of 0.65 units per hour, okay? So I took the drop here, all right? Now, the next day, I did the same thing. I took the dose. I had the same amount of, of, of cereal and milk. I, I combined the, the seven and the five that I took and made it 12, okay? Seems like a lot, but that's what I did. And notice that I pretty I stayed in range, but then I had this late rise, this late delta wave here, and I went ahead and took that five units I'd taken the day before, and I took another drop. Okay, I preempted again. Okay, now the third day, the third day because I'm on a pump, I um, I took that twelve up front. Then over the next three hours, I took that five units. I took about two hours later, an hour and a half later, and I, and I took it then as an extended. So I took uh, you know a twelve up front, three extended. And notice I managed to keep it all in range, okay? That's just an, an example of how you use each attempt to make a better attempt the next time. Now, I'm not saying you'll get it the third time's a charm, guys. You know, that's, that's the meaning, of course. But you, know, you may get it on the first try. You know, you may get it on the second. You may have to take five or six tries. If it, but if you love Honey Nut Cheerios, go for it. You know, but it's whatever, whatever you like to do, whatever is your, one of your favorites. So eye chaining is all about trying to catch that wave, okay? And again, as I said before, I don't know, and, and this is maybe, I'm, I think I'm on solid ground by saying this, if Loop would pick that up. I just don't know. Uh, maybe Joanne or somebody can tell me later, but uh, I dosed at a, a heretofore unheard of level of glycemia, okay? I didn't have to wait for this to come up here to, to turn it. I turned it as a prevention, and that's called preempting. And to me, again, that's, a, that's an advanced move. That's an advanced move. Uh, and if, if Loop can do that, that's wonderful. That's great. You may have to wait for a little bit more of a trend for, for the algorithm to pick it up or not. But that's one of the things that I do. And I know that some of the, um, one of the guys that posted before uh, this afternoon made some comments about doing that uh, to get some rapid acting of insulin effect on sooner. And uh, I think those are great techniques. And if that's the way you, the best way to do it while you're on Loop, then I'm all for it. Okay. So, I dose a lot on deltas, which means as things are going up, I make that decision. How long has it been since the last dose? What kind of meal have I had? Um, you know, uh, is this going to last for eight hours like I showed you before with that, those ribs and, and fries? Um, and so dosing on deltas is a, is a rather advanced sugar surfing skill. Uh, your loops will do that just based on continuing to increase the basal delivery and or if they give corrective dosages. So this is kind of embedded in your, in your loop technology, I believe. 
Oatmeal, okay, just another example of food. And I, I put these blue mountains here just to represent the glycemic effect and, uh, I'm sorry, the insulin effect, and the red mountain is the glycemic effect. I conceptualized that the oatmeal lasted about as long as that red mountain, but my, uh, my humalog, that's what I'm using here, I'm not using regular, my humalog uh, had these effects. And as you can see, I overlaid them on the trend line. And as that delta wave was occurring right here, it's when this first dose was fading and this, this uh, oatmeal was still working. And I needed a secondary dose. And that's where I gave this. And I gave a smaller dose in the first one, as you can see. But uh, that's how I worked that with that, that particular bowl of oatmeal. Now, just to show you, I, I do eat oatmeal a lot. So this is literally today's. So this is from this morning, okay? I took a picture of this. This was oatmeal today. Uh, I have figured out a sequence in, through experimentation because sugar servers like to experiment a little bit, right? And figure out when the right time to eat versus when I take the dose. And that's what I use the sensor for is to make my next attempts better. And so I'm pretty good at, at leveling out things like this and other meals because they, I practiced with them. And these are meals that I like to eat. Now, it's not like I eat everything in the world, so I focus on the things I eat quite a bit. Um, I've gotten pretty good with certain types of pizza. But even that, you know, Pizza Hut is different than Domino's. It's different than, you know, uh, Little Caesars. It, it just depends. And, and so you have to know your product as well. So in this case, I had two slices of pepperoni, and I had a notice. I had nothing, just a small little delta wave. You know, every now and then you just, you nail it, right? And every now and then you don't. And every now and then it goes up. That's the chaos and the uncertainty part of diabetes we have to come to grips with. And not because we failed, just because that's part of what happens. When I was in Atlanta, I went manicotti surfing. They took me out to another Italian place and asked me to eat this stuff. And so it's like I have to eat for my, you know, for my dinner. That's, uh, you know, perform, perform for my dinner. But uh, I did this, and it's very interesting. This was an experiment. I'd never eaten this stuff before. Uh, I eat manicotti at home, but not there, this, this, this restaurant. But I estimated, they told me 75 grams. I asked about it. I tried five units because I thought it was slow. You know, it's, it's pasta. Uh, but notice it just dipped down. And then I think right around here is when the duration of ins effective duration of insulin stopped. And then I, kept, then I kept an eye on this after I saw this going out. I took three units, and I just kept an eye on it, Okay. This is when I did my preemptive move. And again, that's at 91, okay? I don't know if Luke would have picked that up, okay? But I did three units here. Notice it came up on a small delta, continued on, and finally inflected. You can call that the lag, I guess, for that three units. And pretty much bobbled around on a shelf here. And I took my 14 units of Degladec, and nothing else was necessary the rest of the night. Pretty straight for the rest of the night. Um, thought that was interesting, but that was managing the moment. I can't say if I had manicotti at Olive Garden that that would be the same thing as manicotti at this place. You got to remember that. So foods are all different based on how they're prepared and where you get them at. Okay, so I think I've kind of beat to death the preempting thing here. Just remember, preempting is often done when I have a slow carbohydrate meal, when I have an effective insulin duration of action I can estimate, and I dose on the delta wave, okay? And I always, always, always have my foot on the brake if I need it fast acting carbs if in case I drop too much. Okay. Always ready to do that. And, and don't, you can't just expect the, uh, expect it to be uh, nothing but net when you do this. Okay. Um, one of the places I do like to go, anybody knows me, it's a joke almost. I, every Wednesday there's a fast food, there's an in and out burger. You guys, it's the home in, in and out in South, Southern California. I know that, but double, double animal style. Okay. No fries, just double, double animal style and a small iced tea. And uh, I can, I'm pretty good now through practice and knocking this out with one dose and timing it just right. So just to show you. Um, and as I said earlier about style, somebody asked me about, do you, we talk about exercise? I, I do in the larger talks, but I'll, this is my exercise example. Yeah, I, I usually take a five mile, I walk five miles today. I walk five miles, I'm usually at six o'clock in the morning before it gets too hot out here. And um, Notice I use exercise to manipulate blood sugar. In this case, it dropped a bit, but I also had to take some carbs along the way on this particular day. There are other days I can walk completely five miles, same pace, it takes the same amount of time and have no effect, uh, and no, require no carbohydrate corrections. So every, every time I do it can be slightly different. I have actually been on the high side and I've taken less than half the correction to bring that down with a walk. Now I'm not running, I'm walking. A run would be different. And I would, it, would have, it would affect how much I would take if I was trying to bring down a blood sugar uh, through the action of a walk, uh, of a run compared to a walk. So walking is another one of those style things where you can use something like a walk or, or some sort of physical exercise along with your standard formulas for insulin and carbohydrates to manipulate, and I use that word in a positive way, manipulate the trend line, okay? 
Microdosing is the bomb, and I think this is the one thing that loopers need to be, if they're not already doing it, um, that, that you're probably uh, most uh, using the most. And that is, even when you're within your parameter fields, when you're in your, between your upper and lower limits, uh, you might want to be able to steer things fairly tightly. Um, and this is just an example of that. And you have to be able to subtly see these things. That's what I said earlier about, you know, the matrix reference. You got to be able to see this and see that delta wave and see that this went up from, that went up 30 points, easily 30 points. It doesn't look that way, but it is. And, and you have to decide, is that significant? Maybe it is, maybe it didn't. But in this case, uh, after this occurred and this shelf was here, uh, I decided I'd like to bring that down. So I took three units, <coughs> excuse me, and then over the next hour or so, uh, brought it back down, back to a steady shelf. And this insulin effect tapered off right around here compared to here. And that was relative, my relative uh, effective dose of insulin action, okay? Microdosing, I think that's extremely important for, our, uh, for, for the looping crowd. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking about this and, and, and the closing, talk about looking back, okay? Looking backward. Okay, I put this out as a teaser. I know it got Jessica all, you know, excited. What does this mean? And I wouldn't tell her. So uh, WWHSS, okay? I use this in the office when I pull up um, um, uh, the CGM data, uh, the AGPs, the uh, ambulatory glucose profiles, in this case, a trend, a trend line, an average trend line, as you can see, for 14 days. And I discuss this with the families because I'm trying to get them to look at this. Somebody put in one of the questions, they get real frustrated where people are, they go see the doctor and they tell them what to do based on looking at these. I'm totally with you on that. That's why I'm trying to, I'm, I'm pushing back and getting the patients to try to do this themselves. But what does WWHSS, don't give me any profane things is what this means, okay? It means what, okay, what? When I look at this, I'll tell people, I can tell you what is there. I can describe the watts, okay? And there's lots of watts there. The second W is when. I, that's easy. That's a no-brainer. I can tell you when things are happening. I can tell you what's occurring, okay? Now, that's where my influence as a provider, as a diabetes educator, kind of ends, right? I, I can't. I, I, what I can do, I cannot tell you the W and the H. I can't tell you the why. I can't tell you the how. You know, I, I, I have one of my loopers. I get to follow her night scout on my phone. And uh, I see all sorts of stuff going every which direction. She's a 16-year-old weightlifter. And, um, you know, I, I know full well a lot of the whys are she just she doesn't bowl us, you know, and, and, and she, or she gets bowl. She's late to bowl us. Now, no, that doesn't happen to any of you guys. I realize that. But, uh, but you know, I, I, that's what I see. And, uh, but the whys in the house are the ownership of you guys, the people whose data this is. So I try to emphasize why this is important for you to learn how to do. And one thing I'd like to show, too, is this is 14 days. Now, look at this one. This is 90 days. Same person, 90 days. Now, I'm going to back up to 14. Notice that the actual overall pattern of the trend line is not that different. So what does that tell you? I'm going to read some insights here. I tell you, this is person is kind of a creature of habit, right? Creature of habit. And it, this is consistent over 90 days, the same pattern. This one's a little bit more granular, but 90 days. So it reminds me a little bit of... You know, you, how many of you guys have a dog that tracks in the same spot in the backyard? My dogs all did that, and they still do, okay? And uh, so creature of habit, just like the puppy here, you know, that has all, they can go anywhere else in the, in the place, but burning, burning up a trail between the gate and one gate and the other gate, okay? So here's an example, another WWHSS, okay? What, when? Now, there's, there's the what circled in red, okay? And you can see the when, okay? How am I supposed to know the why and the how? Okay, well, I have to ask a few questions, and hopefully people will be honest. What I found out was this is, guess what this is due to? Big candy and eater, okay? Uncovered candy, okay? It's pretty consistent, too. So uh, I think it's video game time and hitting the bag of Jolly Ranchers or something. I don't know, but uh, that's what that was. So me going in and jacking around with this basal rate or asking him to do something different with his loop or whatever, I mean, I'm not sure, it wasn't a looper, but the point being is, uh, you know, I could easily go off on a tangent and try to change the substance of things, okay? And that brings me to the last two, substance and style. Uh, but it was really not the substance, it was the style. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't covering that. He was doing something that was, not, that was outside of just what uh, his meal plan was or what his uh, insulin dose was. So this is a, one of the final slides I want to show you. 
this is the compare app. Now, I don't want to get too commercial on you, but this is a Dexcom thing, so I will say that. But I don't know if any of your apps uh, do this. Uh, and I'll tell you why I think it's cool. Uh, you can pull up the compare app on the Clarity report, and you can see two side-by-side -side windows of whatever time frame you want to put. I just show two seven days. It could be 14, it could be three days, it could be whatever. And, um, and I tell them, I said, whatever we decide we're going to change today, whatever you're going to change today, what's going to happen is in one week, if we change substance or style, in one week, that's going to shift over to the left, and we'll have a new fresh week or two weeks or what have you on the right, and we can visually compare those two, uh, those two images, okay? I had a guy about three weeks ago tell me, uh, as I was having this discussion, he said, time out, Dr. Ponder, time out. Uh, you, I'll tell you why I have this big spike in the middle of the day. It's all fairly steady, and then there's a spike in the day, and then there's, it's steady in the afternoon and the evening. So that, well, I said, well, what's up? He said, well, I'm bolusing 45 minutes after I eat. Okay, okay, I don't need to go in there and change anything. And, you know, why don't we try to uh, make an adjustment in when you bolus so we can prevent or at least mitigate that rise. And if it still rises, then maybe we need to change something in the substance. So really, we should change, uh, look at the style first, before we jump and just change substance. And that's one of the biggest failings of, of a lot of endos and a lot of diabetes people is they, all they see are these, these black and white numbers and, and they don't always know what's behind them. And, and it's sometimes hard to get that out of people too. And not all of my, my youngsters are always totally honest. I try to be non-judgmental and everything. Uh, and I'm glad most of my mind do tell me what they're doing. And we, then we try to find some way to work out a solution there. The other thing I like to point out too is that, and this is, I don't have a graphic for this, but this uh, data, all that data that I show you there on these grids, if you put that in number format, like I did at the very beginning of the talk and show how the numbers turn into points uh, or dots, um, that would be overwhelming for the average person to, co to conceptualize. However, if, I'm, if I turn it into a graphic, our, our visual corte cortexes are, are designed to look and interpret this information instantaneously. And then when you line them up as a comparison, even more so. So let me give you another my, my, my example of this. This was sent to me about a week and a half ago. Uh, and again, this is a three-day window. But this is just, notice the difference in that. You don't have to know what the numbers are to see there's a significant change there, right? And you can drill down and look at specific areas, do the what and the winds and all that. But um, this is just a, a good example. The family was beside themselves when they sent this to me because um, they had never heard of the compare feature, even though they had a clarity thing, they never looked at that app. And they said, we'll be we using this all the time. This is, this is the bomb, right? So uh, just, I throw this out there. Now, if Night Scout does this or Tide Pool, that's great. And maybe they will, maybe they do. I, I don't, I don't know, but uh, I know, I don't, Sugar Mate doesn't do it, but, uh, but this is a, a nice little feature that you can use if you have a DEX and you're, uh, and you get the clarity, uh, 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 the professional, the, the uh, report thing. So again, WWHS, what, when, why, how, substance and style. Those are all very important things you're trying to make some decisions. Okay, um, we're on the, on, the on, the, on the final approach here. Our major takeaways, surf, see the patterns, understand their significance, respond appropriately, follow up carefully. You're managing a situation, my friends, not just a number, not just a carb count, not, you know, you're managing a situation and that goes, that goes beyond the numbers, okay? Start with your prescribed management at first. Do, do what you've been asked to do, okay? Before you start considering deviating from it. Uh, I think you have, I know you have a lot of fantastic mentors in Joanne and many of the people that are, that are administrators at this site that can guide you guys on how to do this, uh, to use loop in this fashion. I try to calibrate a steady basal effect. And I, I was trying for, before the pandemic hit to get in touch with Kenny. I mean, uh, um, we were trying to talk about uh, about trying to simplify basal rates. I'm a I'm a big proponent of a of a single basal rate theory, and I know that uh, a lot of you guys uh, do that and uh, or try to get simple with the basal rate. I, I like to think uh, fewer basals are better, and I'm not going to get into that discussion. But uh, calibrate a steady basal effect. The, the 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 job of basal insulin is to basically keep you steady. Okay, you loopers actually do use it as a steering tool, though. That's what makes you unique. Is that you use basal to, for steering? Okay, uh, it's just that the steering takes a little bit longer to kick in, and you might want to consider doing some microboluses uh, somewhere along the way, in some fashion or another, to to facilitate uh, uh, those those changes. Should they tend to get ahead of you, uh, the delta waves might kick in too much. Um, 
learn the effect of insulin, food, exercise, and stress. I mean, study your own results as they happen. Make mental notes. I mean, it's just your diabetes you have to worry about, not 15 other people or your kids, if it happens to be your kid that you're, that's the looper. And remember, if you know anybody, this is my plug for the nonprofit. We give out free eBooks to newly diagnosed people with type 1 diabetes under 90 days. Free, free eBooks. Uh, and I just, that's been standing offer for several years now. These are our core shapes. I, I put a blog out a while back on that. These are just your basic shapes to get comfortable with. Um, the principles, a CGM, just like a pump, is no better or worse than its user. Uh, flux and drift happen. Flux is either delta waves or drops. Drift is, is basically a shelves. Just you have, we have to learn how to steer these things and to do them prudently or let loop do it for us. And then we step in when we think loop needs some backup. Uh, we're managing situations, not just the blood sugar anymore. Keep that eye on the trend line. Take a look at it. Doesn't mean you're going to do anything about it, but just be aware of it. You know, take a glance at it from time to time. Being patient sometimes is a huge virtue with sugar surfing. Just waiting for something to, to declare itself before you decide if you take action. Don't over respond. Don't be afraid to experiment a little when you can. I put a post out on experimentation recently. Uh, that's why I put it out there. You can read a little bit more about that. Learn how to microdose. That's why I think loopers can really get a lot of benefit from this talk. Uh, don't let good enough be an enemy. Um, and I say that as a person, and I'm sure Joanne would tell you the same thing. I'm living with this for 55 years, you know, 56 years in her case. Uh, good enough works, you know, good enough works, you know, you, you got to pace yourself. I've been doing this as a marathon. And, and those of you that have had it long, like, like we have, I, I, I like to think you understand that too. Um, try to preempt when you get smart, uh, smart enough and comfortable enough and get ahead of those waves. And remember, most importantly, sugar, syrup is a, sugar syruping is a skill. It's not a recipe. Anybody that came into this talk thinking I was going to give them some, some, you know, formula or some software package for this, uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 that's not what I do. I'm trying to teach or explain a skill, which if you rehearse and practice enough, you will become a master, a master at doing this. I want to thank Joanne and all the SoCal Loopers, all of you, however many of you stuck with us through this hour and a half. Um, I sugarserving.com. I have o over a hundred or so uh, posts out there every day, just kind of as some throwback month. Uh, you'll be seeing more of those coming out. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Um, any emails you can send to admin at sugarserving.com. I don't want to forget my wonderful co-author, Kevin McMahon, who's a father of a lovely young lady with type one diabetes, who's now in nursing school, who's had diabetes since she was age three. And we've collaborated uh, uh, on this and many other projects over the years. And, um, and if you want, if anybody still wants a print book, uh, they can just go to sugarserving.com and order it there and we will ship it anywhere in the United States. Um, we do have a shipment going to Australia right now and, uh, books are being sold down there. We're just waiting for the U S postal service <laughs> to get them down there. So they've been a bit slow as you probably know. So, um, with that, with, with all of that, and with no more ado, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and I'm going to turn this back over to Joanne. We have a few questions, just real short questions. Uh, first of all, that was extraordinary. Thank you so much for your organization. Uh, the way you presented is absolutely clear and very much appreciated. Uh, we have a question from um, Allison who asked, um, do you have any high level information about how to deal with changes from menstrual cycle hormone fluctuations? Would you suggest changing settings? throughout methodically or just surfing more in the moment to try to tap the trend lines up or down? I had a young lady <clears throat> that, well, I could answer more than just this, but um, a young lady asked me the other day when I was showing her the, uh, um, the compare function. And she asked me, will you pull up my report from June 1st to June 10th and July 1st to July 10th? And, um, and I did that and I was thinking for a second, then it hit me what she was looking for. She wanted to see what her blood glucose patterns look like in comparison from month to month in the time uh, or before her menstrual cycle occurred. She was, she was actually plotting it out using that function to slice out those pieces of information, do side by side comparisons. I thought that was a brilliant uh, application or insightful use of, of that compare function. As I and so that that was going to give her some information where she might be able to decide, do I need to make some incremental changes? Well, most people from a menstrual cycle standpoint, the basic biology of this are if you're having regular, fairly regular menstrual cycles during uh, the uh, before you actually have the period, you typically are having a, a period of a week or so where you may actually have some significant 
uh, uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and that's due to the combined effect of estrogen and, uh, and progesterone, okay, if, if you've ovulated, okay? Uh, and then once the period occurs or right before it occurs, as those hormone levels dwindle, which is how menstrual cycles work, uh, then those antagonistic forces are going away and hence insulin response tends to recover a bit. And so that's why mapping out uh, how regular one is could be very helpful in knowing when to make uh, increases and or decreases in, in global settings, whether they're basal settings or even across the board settings. And, and I, 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 many of the women and young ladies I take care of, some don't seem to have any impact, uh, it, at least any measurable impact I can see or they can find uh, from menstrual cycles and their blood sugar patterns. Others have very profound ones. And so it, it is an individual thing, again, just like everything else is, it's individual. So um, I would say that typically uh, in the time leading up to the period for most people, and I'm sure there are exceptions out there, you're going to be needing more uh, insulin coverage. And if you're going to do that empirically, if you, uh, you're talking about maybe five or 10% adjustments and documenting that, and then looking back at your own data to see and compare if you made an impact. And that's where I would use that compare function. I really would, unless you have another program that can do it for you. I think that's a fascinating tool. It's very grossly underutilized and not, not, not promoted enough uh, out there in the community to compare. That's great. Uh, I'm gonna to try to hold it to two more questions. Um, what percentage time and range is typical in your pediatric uh, diabetic patients? You know, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I've got kids on sensors uh, of, uh, across the age spectrum, of course, and across the socioeconomic spectrum. And probably more importantly, but more, it matters more is across the motivational spectrum. Okay, if you know what I mean. I think everybody knows what I mean by that. Um, some people are extremely highly motivated. Uh, their parents are very supportive, uh, not, not yet not you know, on their backs all the time. There's just that overall balance and so on. I see people that have percent in ranges in, the, uh, in, in that group in the 70s uh, to sometimes 80 uh, range. Um, many of them that are seeing this information perhaps for the first time after getting on a sensor uh, are really, some of them are down the 40% range and 30% range. Um, and, you know, these are good kids and they're, they're trying to live normal lives and they're, they, they're doing the best they can. Um, and, but diabetes may not be their top priority. Uh, at this point. They've got football, they've got boyfriends, they've got uh, other things. Uh, they may have other challenges. Uh, they have multiple responsibilities and so on. And I can't compel them. I try to encourage them, but I got to be careful too. I don't want to come down as judgmental and telling them what to do. And, and I don't want to make them feel bad. That's the last thing I want to do. I try to build them up. And so if I can, if I can find something that I can fall back on that I can encourage that will encourage them some little success that can that empowers them that makes them more self-confident which is really the trick My, the trick of seeing people at all at any age is to empower them is to provide self-confidence and um, CGM data hits you it comes at you fast and if you're not careful you're going to judge yourself too harshly and I really try to get people not to use it as a judgment of who you are I showed you some examples of mine yeah I get high blood sugars too that made me a bad person I fix them, you know, not going to feel bad about them. I'm not going to feel guilty about that. And I know some people come in, they feel like they're made to feel guilty. Either they've, they've somehow have been led to believe that they were a bad parent or they're a bad person with diabetes or the kid's been bad. And so they start, you know, they may start making stuff up. Um, you know, 90% of what I do, and I think most of us would agree with that, is psychological, it's behavioral, it's trying to encourage and empower people, especially when you think about the 35,000 choices the average adult and about the 20,000 choices the average teenager has to make every day. No way on God's green earth I can make all their choices for them. You know, all I can do is usually screw things up more than I can help things. I try not to do that. That's my first priority is not screw things up, but to empower people and to encourage them. Get them to try something new maybe and, and not raise the bar so high that they're going to feel like they're failing. That's, the, that's, that's how I approach it at least. <laughs> That's fabulous. All right, I have a comment, a question, and then a challenge to you. Uh, one comment uh, from Maureen. Uh, I just lost it. Um, okay, I've been reading my Night Scout um, data while listening to you, and your comments have helped me analyze my charts. So thank you. It has been useful. From uh, Jamie, um, are you... Um, are your two-hour post-meal delta wave doses carefully calculated or more of an experienced guess? Um, they're, usually, um, they're usually related in some fashion to the first dose, as I said, but I did show some exceptions. 
And that was overridden by the fact that the meal itself is rather large. Okay. That's about as much as I could say about those, but they're usually stair step down. I realize that some of that food is going to be metabolized uh, in a, in a two hour time frame. And uh, just like if you're saying duration of insulin effect, and we all know there's a carbohydrate on board type effect too. Uh, and some, some meals last longer than others. And uh, so I'm estimating it's an estimate. Yeah. So I guess back to your original question, is it, is it a guesstimate? Oh, it's an intelligent guess. Yeah, it is a bit of an intelligent, but I don't go out of the, out of the, I don't go bonkers on the ranges. I have a very, fairly narrow range of insulin doses I give for me. Okay. Now I know for a lot of you guys, three units would be a lot. You know, for me, my, my effective range of insulin, I can get some measurable effect is anywhere from a half a unit to about eight. Okay. I have been known to take more, but on extreme, certain extreme cases, I know some people out there are, are quite resistant. You may take 10 or 15 uh, regularly. So again, we're all different. We're all different. We're all different people. And so I, I don't, don't look at me as what you should be doing. The principles are what, what I want people to appreciate. And it sounds like that, that got across tonight. It did. Um, so the challenge from Mark, who is one of our admins, um, I think it would be fascinating to see your new book after you spend a month looping with a pod on one of the AB, which are automatic bolus branches. So if you do that, we would love to have you come back and share that information with us. And we'll, oh, we will help you get yeah, up and going. <laughs> That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Yeah, I, uh, you know, like I said, I, I, not to get too far, too long winded, but I got I live, my granddaughter's living with us. Uh, my daughter, we're, we're, I'm pretty busy right now, and the work's got me busy, and we're all COVIDy and all that kind of stuff. We're all in the same boat there. So uh, the one thing I'd love to do is do some of the book over again. I've been putting out a lot more posts and recycling some things, but uh, um, yeah, I've thought about that. Uh, I really have, and uh, so I won't. I can't rule it out. Won't rule it out. I was on a pump for 35 years. You know, so, uh, but not a, not a closed loop anything. And I've been on a sensor since the mid 2000s. My first sensor was a, a Gluca watch, you know, from nine, 2001. I think a lot of you guys were on that maybe. Uh, they're bringing that thing back, I think. And uh, then, and I tried the Medtronic harpoons and all that kind of stuff too. But it wasn't until I got my Abbott Navigator in 2008 that I really kind of got on board. And that was, so it's been 12 years. That was and a great thing. Yeah. around in 2011, 2012. Yeah. And that's, been the wave I've been writing for ever since then. Gotcha. No, that was a great CGM. Um, no, I, I will offer you up, Glenn and Kenny, to help you get up and going on loop like instantly, but whenever you're ready and we understand timing. I want to thank you for the time. It, it flew. Um, it's an amazing presentation. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of viewers on and probably double that who will be watching the review when we're done. So, Thank you. Thank you so very much. I will send you questions that come up um, after the presentation. I, I, I just can't thank you enough. Just wanted well, I want to thank everybody for letting me be here. Uh, I have one last off the wall request and I made this of uh, Jeff Hitchcock for FFL. Uh, he told me that there was somebody at FFL this year that was from that uh, an, uh, an attendee from Antarctica. And we do have not gotten the book to Antarctica yet. Okay. So if there's anybody in this call that has friends with diabetes in Antarctica, have them call me or email me and we will send them a free ebook. And I can say we have the book on every freaking continent of the planet. <laughs> okay. So it's my, that's one of my last bucket list things, right? Got it. I do actually got, I see, I see Cassidy's got Antarctica. friends and you got friends and you got friends, Cassidy. And you, I love you. I love you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs> send it to my email. We'll take care of you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Take care. Y'all have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Woo!